but um, the next speaker we've got is Chris Boyke. Um, so Chris is Professor of Health Economics at University of Leeds. And Chris, I think you're going to talk to us about using data, or national data and non-randomised data to, to inform economic analysis. Over to you, Chris. Thanks. Right, thank you. So hopefully you can see my screen. And hopefully you can see that fine. Yeah, thanks. Right, thanks. And it, it really follows on, I think, uh, from, from Rachel's excellent talk this morning. So some of the issues that she, she uh, brought up and some of the questions that came up from, from that will hopefully uh, be resolved with, with this little chat. So um, there's two key things here. It's the routinely available data and probably most importantly, non-randomized real world data. And I'm going to struggle now to move stuff on. So. OK, so just an outline of what I want to talk about. Um, just want to introduce some of the types of data that we commonly use in this area and how they're being used because there are different ways we could use it. I'm going to outline what the big problem is with using uh, the non-RCT element of this data. And then we'll probably spend quite a bit of time discussing and trying to motivate some of the sophisticated methods that we have to, uh, to address that. And a key point of this is going to be that whenever you're using non-randomized control trial data, you have to have some kind of method to uh, accommodate or, or the possible biases that you might get. You can't just leave it to chance. And then we'll summarize things at the end there. So what type of data are we looking at? So by routinely, we're really looking at data that's collected for purposes other than analysis. And um, the big issue with that is it's that it may not collect all the necessary variables that we'd, we'd like to have for economic evaluation. And the key one, as Rachel pointed out this morning, is EQ5D. It's, it's very, very rare that you will come across a, a routinely collected data set that actually includes EQ5D. But there are benefits of these as well. Sometimes you can actually find some really great detailed information in these data sets that would be very difficult to collect otherwise. And another key benefit for it is that it's, it's being collected over time. So when you do get those situations where you are asked to analyze something after the fact, um, the fact that this data has already been collected doesn't, doesn't provide any problems with that. So in terms of the type, the, the ones we commonly used are data that are being primarily collected for payment purposes. And these are things like hospital episode statistics, which contain sort of every um, patient hospital interaction that occurs in England. Uh, and we also now have added to that, it's not commonly known, but um, all the prescriptions data that is, is dispensed in the community is also now available from NHS England. Now, there are incredible problems about accessing this data, which I'm going to just completely and utterly gloss over, but you do need to spend quite a bit of time uh, applying for this data and reassuring the providers that you can safely uh, store this data. But these data are national, it's, it's everybody there, so it's very representative. And there are, standards imposed on the data, which I think are very important from an analysis point of view as well. So a patient that has gone to your hospital uh, and had certain procedures done to them in a patient pathway, if they'd instead say gone to Manchester and had exactly the same thing happen to them, I would expect those data items to look similar, very similar indeed, if not the same. And because they're used for payment, it's actually really quite easy to start attaching costs, et cetera, to these things via reference costs, which are also publicly available. We've also got data that is collected for clinical management and some key data sources there you may have heard of, CPRD, GPRD, and, and, and Research Want. Um, they're, they're primary care systems, so it's a software that GPs, uh, primary care, use to, to store clinical data about uh, their patients. Uh, we also have things like staffing tools and hospitals as, as well, which may be used to collect these things. Now, these aren't always necessarily representative. They're not national. The primary care systems have a, a bit of a regional uh, distribution to them. And the most important thing about them is that they, they're used by individuals for their own purposes. So the coding standards not, may not be the same. Uh, and that makes it a little bit more messy and problematic, I think. So uh, the example I gave of a patient being either in York or Manchester and having the same data recorded in HES, I, I wouldn't necessarily always expect that I'll, I'll be so confident it's true for a, a York patient in my local uh, primary care centre. Instead, if I'd gone to Manchester, the data may look slightly different. But it is easy to attach generic costs to them as well. There's sort of a um, PSSRU have uh, data on the average cost of GP surgery consultations, so we can attach that type of data as well. 
So what do we use the data for? Well, we can actually use it alongside our RCTs as well. I'm very briefly going to gloss over this. So you don't have to just use routine data for, for where you don't have trials. You can use it alongside trials. And if you're looking at hospitalizations, it actually seems to be a lot better, I think, to be using stuff like HAIRS, which is very, very, very detailed, doesn't require patient recollection. And we can look at it over extended periods as well. And at the bottom there, there's a little link to a project that we're involved with now called Iskamat, which is looking at heart medications, which extensively uses HES instead of trying to elicit responses from patients. But it is in, in the context of an RCT. There's also a very interesting uh, side of literature emerging now, which is using um, routine data to supplement RCTs called target trial emulation, which is looking to see whether uh, if we impose inclusion exclusion criteria on observational data, do we get what we see in the trials and if so can we expand what we get from that to, to using um to forming expectations on people not included in trials but the big thing we're really going to concentrate on here is um using routine data instead of rcts and uh, we're going to, that means we're going to be using the routine data to try and estimate causality and the big problem we have is that as soon as you move away from rcts you're suddenly at risk of creating biases in your estimates, mainly due to the impact of unobserved factors which influence treatment as, as well as um, outcomes. And as I said very early on, what we really need is some sort of specific um, identification strategy to account for this potential bias. Okay, so what is the danger? And the three questions we really need to ask ourselves here, is the treatment allocation random or systematic? And this is a very, very important point because Ultimately, what we're going to say is, is that random variation is good. Systematic variation can lead to sort of biases. It's a bit animal farm, this two, was it two legs bad, four legs good. But in practice, the use of random allocation uh, to identify effect is, is, is good and systematic can cloud our understanding of the true effect. If we do have systematic variation in treatment allocation, we need to ask ourselves, is it related to the expected outcomes of, of factors that can influence outcomes as well? And if so, is there some way of observing or otherwise controlling for these factors? And we can ask ourselves two supplement questions when we get to three. Can, is there some way we can separate out random and systematic variation? Or can we exploit the timing of discrete interventions and try and control for differences by using sort of before and after data? And if we arrive at no, at the end of question three, then we've really got to be concerned that any use of routine data is going to lead to um, biased estimates of effect. And the main source of this is what we call omitted variable bias. So for example, if a variable like say frailty is unobserved, but also strongly positively correlated with the treatment choice, but is also likely to cause worse outcomes in general, then we're going to underestimate the impact of the treatment as it will be contaminated by the uncontrolled impact of frailty. So if frail patients tend to get one type of treatment more than another, even if that treatment is, has a very positive effect, unless you uh, account for the, the underlying effect of frailty itself, we're going to get biased uh, outcomes. And depending on the strength of the relationships, we may even get results which go in completely the wrong direction. Uh, and the impact will be in the other direction if the correlation is either way around. So if, if um, uh, <clears throat> better sort of patients are likely to get uh, the treatment, it might overestimate the impact. And the key thing to understand here is that RCTs ensure the correlation doesn't occur. So with RCTs, we're not arguing that there isn't uh, other factors that influence results, but in order for us to have biased estimates, there has to be a correlation between those factors and treatment allocation. An RCT nips that in the bud straight away. It ensures that correlation doesn't occur, so we're safe to just look at, say, comparisons of means. Okay, so I've raced through all of that. Hopefully you're still following me. Um, in order to get down to, I think, the more interesting components of, of this talk, which is how do we then for identify uh, causality? And I don't think since it's not working. Oh, 
Okay, sorry, that should do it. Yeah, okay. So almost all the methods that we look either try to account for underlying differences uh, between um, experimental units, if you like, and or identify the use of random rather than systematic variation. So, but either way, what we're going to need is some very explicit identification strategy. We can't just do a comparison of means or put in a very simple regression model. We're going to need to, to say exactly how we intend to avoid the potential uh, bias here. And the common ways we can do this, we can often exploit longitudinal data and an intervention occurring in time in some of what we consider experimental units. So this is going to um, hopefully answer Felicity's question from earlier on this morning. Um, sometimes we don't have this, this uh, occurrence happening. So then we have to try and use other techniques, which um, ultimately have to rely on some very happy coincidence in the data that generates some random variation in treatment allocation. And really, really importantly, and I think this is this is underdone a little bit in the uh, in practice, we really do need to explore the plausibility of these strategies as best we can and understand the consequences for the results where we feel they may not be uh, satisfied. So let's look at some of the evaluation techniques that exploit time. So one of the key ones, uh, and you may have heard of this, is a difference in difference approach. And what we have here, and hopefully you can see my little arrow, is that you have two groups, one group um, are subjected to an intervention and a control group, which aren't. Now, and you have two points of observation, a pre-intervention period and a post-intervention period. So quite, quite limited. And if we look at the left-hand side of this graph here, if the outcomes are say positive, you can see the group that uh, are subjected to the intervention at some point, generally have better outcomes than the group who aren't. Now you would of course not expect to see this in an RCT. So we've got this uneven sort of allocation here, we've got allocation of the treatment to, to the, the group that tend to have better outcomes anyway. Then our post intervention, at some point we take uh, another measurement and we see that those who are in the intervention group have improved their outcomes to here and those in the control group have just improved their outcomes to here. Now, we may be tempted to compare the outcomes in the intervention group from here to what they were and estimate the effects here. But this ignores the fact that actually, even without an intervention, there probably would have been an increase in um, good outcomes. And um, what we do is we, we take what we've measured here, the general trend, and we assume it would have happened to those in the intervention group as well, allowing for this constant difference here. So the intervention effect is actually what we measure here. Now this makes a very, very strong assumption of parallel trends that what happened, what would have happened to this group here is captured by the difference in this group here. So hence the difference in difference. So that's reasonable, but it makes a very strong assumption. We've also got something called interrupted time series, which doesn't bother with the control group. You might have, uh, practices or, 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 or units where we observe say hospitalizations over time. And then at some point there is an intervention occurs. And what we can do is we can set up a, a mathematical model that captures the trend specifically. So instead of assuming really what the trend was for this group, the intervention group, we measure it. And then when the intervention occurs, we may observe a drop in the outcome measure and then a change in slope as well. And I quite like this, graph because what it does very clearly is it it, it 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 maps the mathematical model to the concepts here. But the big problem with this one, of course, is that there's no control group. So you have to hope, keep your fingers crossed, that actually nothing occurred here, which also affects outcomes and that we get confused with. And there is an alternative approach, which is called the controlled interrupted time series, which brings both of these elements to, uh, together. So you have control and intervention, and you allow for um, uh, uh, the trend to change as well for the observed group, as well as the counterfactual. And um, this gives you, this allows you to compare the two and actually, actually make a, a much more robust estimate on what the intervention effect was. So if we consider all of these things, um, the difference in difference, it does have a control group, but it makes very, it has two time points and makes very strong assumptions about trend. 
The interrupted time series doesn't have a control group. You can measure trend, but you have to keep your fingers crossed nothing else has happened. Whereas these controlled interrupted time series does have a control group. It allows for the differences between them and actually it allows for something else to happen here, which impacts the control as well as the intervention. It allows you to unpick all of these things. So if we just very quickly look at an example for this, um, several years ago, uh, Laura, Jerry, and myself and another colleague who, who's at York, Anna Duarte, were asked to look at the impact of care hubs in York. And care hubs are these models of integrated care systems which are meant to improve patient experience for those at high risk of hospitalization. There were three pilot schemes launched in 2014 uh, in, in York involving 13 of the Vales practices. At some point after that, we were asked to analyze if it had any effect on hospitalizations. Um, so we used the HES data collected on all 29 practices for those three years. Um, we also took um, from routinely available data the practice list sizes, which contained the population measures in, uh, in age and sex categories. And we could work out the proportion of elderly patients experiencing hospital episodes month by month for pra each practice. So this is a spaghetti plot. I know these things look horrendous, but they are actually quite informative. Uh, the, the, Solid lines are practices that eventually became part of the care hubs. The dashed lines are those who don't. And what you can see is actually at the beginning of the graph, they're all intermingled. So it's not as if actually the, the practices that um, started the care hubs had necessarily high rates. And if we look at the end of the graph, it's not as if we see the solid lines diverging from those of the dash. So just a very a casual inspection of that graph suggests there hasn't been much impact. And actually, when we when we start doing the formal models, it's really just about a, um, a bit more formal measurement of these types of, of data. Um, so those graphs are quite informative. Um, the available data we have suggests a controlled interrupted time series. Um, the data are a bit awkward in terms of their outcomes. So we used a Poisson count model adjusted for the population. And we also did something to account for practice level differences in the underlying rates as well. And what we found is, I'm gonna to have to speed up a bit because I haven't timed this particularly well, I apologize. Uh, for various age groups, um, there were differences between them. So if you're a female, 55, more negative means uh, less likely to. Um, as you go up the age groups, it gets more positive and therefore you're more likely. So that's got face validity. There was absolutely no evidence really of a time trend apart from a very small one for female, but very, very small. And here's what we're really interested in here. If the care hubs had had the impact we'd expect, these would all be negative and hopefully statistically significant, as with these. And what we actually find is that um, there wasn't really any great evidence of, of the impact as intended. In fact, if anything, it seemed to be suggesting that uh, the care hubs created more um, hospitalizations. Uh, what we can also do is we can convert these kind of abstract regression results into expectations so we can take our data set and we can say what would we have expected uh, if um, they hadn't introduced care hubs at all and what we actually found was um, with care hubs there's about 101,000 hospitalizations if they hadn't put those 13 of those 13 practices hadn't done the care hubs we would have expected about 100,000 so we could conclude from that rather kind of quick and dirty analysis in a very quick time period, having accounted for the routine nature, but actually we, we didn't find compelling evidence that the care hub pilots worked at all. And indeed that they're, they're no longer in place. So that time you might use the uh, time element. Often we don't have, we don't have um, that luxury. Uh, and in which case we've got to try and observe, <clears throat> we've got to try and find a method which distinguishes between random variation and systematic variation and just use that random variation in the regression models. And the most common way of doing that is something called instrumental variables. It's actually been around since the 1920s formally. Um, and it requires a lucky identification of something that influences treatment allocation, but not the outcomes themselves, but is also not influenced by um, unobserved confounders. And there's a nice little graph here that illustrates that. So you want to find some sort of variable which influences the treatment, and we think the treatment influences outcome, but the instrument doesn't directly affect the outcomes, nor is it affected by the unobserved outcomes. And I've quickly 
put in a little picture of uh, up here of Jon Snow, who, um, although isn't really um, attributed with inventing instrumental variables, I think illustrates this path very nicely. So in the 1850s in London, there was a big cholera outbreak, lots of deaths, etc. And uh, what John managed to sort of figure out was um, that um, the water supply via pumps was randomly distributed across London, so we couldn't measure sort of the water pollution. Uh, but what he could do is find out who served, uh, which water pumps served which areas. It was also the case that actually rich areas had uh, didn't have certain water providers that were kind of higgledy piggledy randomly allocated, rather than rich areas having one water supplier and poorer areas having the other. And what he discovered was by using water supplies as an instrument, he was able to demonstrate the effect there, just after allowing for un unobserved confounders, and because choice of water provider didn't have any impact on outcome, uh, other than because of, of its, um, the exposure to, to, to water pollution, because different um, water providers of, uh, providers drew their water from different places in the Thames. So those that did it before London tended to have clearer water and those after had the polluted one. So they've been used in uh, medical literature really from about uh, 1990. Uh, there's, a, there's a classic example here in, in General of American Medical Association. So obviously our past peer review here, I'm saying that the use of intensive treatments like uh, aggressive use of cardiac catheterization to reduce mortality. The big issue here is, is that, um, do they only really give intensive treatments to those patients who seem more robust? And so is it really the uh, intensive treatment that's leading to longer life expectancy or is it the fact it's just this non-random selection of patients? Uh, we can't use a time series approaches because of the data. So what the authors use with patient distances from alternative types of hospitals that specialize more in intensive treatments as their instrument. And this is the sort of thing that we could do with HES linked to ONS as well. And what they found was using this as an instrument is happy coincidence uh, because those who were closest to those hospitals tended to, to receive those types of treatments that actually using this instrumental variable approach, they found that the estimates decreased from using the naive approach and that the survival benefits from the greater use of catheterization appeared absolutely minimal. Okay, so in practice, it's often very difficult to get good instruments and you often tend to use weak ones. So what I mean by weak is this, this relationship isn't particularly strong. Um, we tend not to really, we, well, we can't formally test some key assumptions like uh, this one here because these things are unobserved. Uh, there has been a bit of a resurgence, I think, in the use of IVs because of this new type known as tendency to operate where the variation has been, the random variation has been picked up by underlying preferences for one treatment over another. So given the patient's characteristic, one hospital or doctor or clinician or whatever might say, well, we think this treatment and another one with exactly that same patient might say, we recommend a different one. And it's this type of underlying preference which uh, introduces this kind of ran element of randomness into um, the treatment allocation, which can be exploited as an instrumental variable. It does rely on this variation being pure preference and not scale, which might be a bit suspect. But for those of you who are interested, NIHR has just, well, a couple of years ago, uh, funded a study which uses precisely these measurements, uh, which looks at the use of emergency surgery in a &E. I think Matt was the, the deputy chair when that was uh, was funded. So you can, you can follow that up to see how that, how modern IVs are being used here. Um, I'm not going to talk about this because I think I've run out of time. I'm just going to drop straight to summary. Um, so there are a large number of routine data sets around which, um, you know, cover a lot of the things that we're interested in. Um, although they're not built for analysis, they are extremely useful source of complete and often very, very detailed information that we might not even be able to get if we try to collect this thing prospectively. Um, there's actually an increasing recognition of the value that such data can bring to analysis. And it's very interesting now that mice have actually expressed a commitment to using more real world data in the evidence base. And there's actually going to be a, 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 a launch of their real world evidence framework in, in June. So we've still got time to to get yourself registered for that if you so wish. 
Um, but although I agree, I think it's very, very useful, and it's I've sort of built my career around this. Um, whilst we can use these data to identify the causal relationships we need to inform economic evaluation, it's absolutely vital that we have some explicit identification strategy in place to try and avoid it, to avoid the biases that can be caused by emitted variables. And we, we um, I've gone through some of them that you can look up. So I think um, continuous interrupted time series is very good where it can be used. It's probably state of the art. And instrumental variables are the other uh, key, key tool that we have where we can't exploit um, differences over time. And I think the, the tendency to operate is a very exciting uh, extension of that. Um, but what we really need to be absolutely on the ball with, I think, is that uh, we shouldn't be seduced by the sophistication of some of these methods. I mean, we need to be absolutely critical of, of the results that we get from them and, and exploring whether those crucial assumptions are actually met. Okay, I think I want to stop there for, for any questions. Um, apologies, but there was an awful lot to try and cram into that small session. So hopefully I haven't gone too fast. And like we said before, the, the slides are available to pour over later and hopefully you have enough references in there to chase up things after the presentations thank you fabulous thanks chris that was that was great and i think all the the references and the further guidance you've given people is really really helpful a lot of that um, i didn't know about so i'll be following up on those um there is a question specific for you but it's about dealing with the sort of covid uh, interruptions and what i'm proposing to do is we put that into the panel discussion because i'm interested to hear other people's kind of experiences of sort of uh, how they are sort of recrafting their work um, given the changes that came about with COVID. So can I kind of bring just everyone straight back into to panel session? Is that all right? And I will pick up the it's Lisa Cummins um, COVID question uh, as part of that. So yeah, could I ask people on the panel just to come back in, please, if you could? 